This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 60, for November 27th, 2009. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And I'm with Dick DePommier. Hey, Vince. How's it going, Dick? It's going very well, Vince. It's the day after. This is the day after Turkey Day, the day after Thanksgiving. Yeah, but we should uh, continue to give thanks. Well, sure, we're always thankful. Yeah, we Did are. you have a good meal? I had a wonderful meal, and you? You know, I cooked the turkey in a paper bag. Un papillon. Un papillon, <laughs> or papillote. It w it's incredibly moist. You should try really? it sometime. Yeah. Really? I, it's the one thing that I've always not liked about turkey. It's dry. Like it's dry, but this made incredibly moist. Well, you should try it. It's very simple. You just have to make sure the bag doesn't have chemicals in it, which perhaps, a lot of them do. <laughs> perhaps we should have given this presentation really last yeah, week rather than week. this week. For all of those in the U.S. who celebrate Thanksgiving, right. happy Thanksgiving. Yep, yep. And what are you doing here on the Friday after Thanksgiving? Hey, listen, I'm a dedicated scientist. All right. <laughs> I came here to do a podcast. I, I came here to do a podcast. That's what so, I should have said. Because you see, we're pretty dedicated to this. We actually enjoy this, though. We love it, but we also want everyone to have their TWIV fix. So this here we are. This is all true. This is all true. And today is another in our continuing series of Virology 101. Right. So far, we've talked about classification. Yep. We've talked about how viruses get into cells. Yep. And now what I want to start for the next couple of uh, Virology 101s is how viruses duplicate their nucleic acid. But before we start, I would like to acknowledge our support because I'm not going to remember halfway through the the uh, lecture as it were. Good point. Good so point. So, let's acknowledge the support. By the way, do you like that glass thing? I love it whatever it is. I'm cleaning I'm cleaning out my lab because I'm moving across the hallway. Oh yeah. And I found this and it's beautiful. It it's attaching to a vacuum. I think thing. it's for. I think it's probably to dry. You put a little calcium pellets in it, and it dries through it. Right. Oh, but, I see. Uh, right. I thought I you could use it as a nice vase for flowers. You could. You could. Oh, of course, it also looks like a. a pipe could use of it some as a sort. water feature. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so you said design on a dime. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Very good. Okay, so our uh, we'd like to first acknowledge the support of Twiv by Citrix, the makers of Go to My PC. And here's the problem. You're spending more time at the office than at home, and that means missing out on your personal life. You feel that way, Dick? No. <laughs> <laughs> because you're Professor Emeritus. Not huh? personally. Well, well, that's because I have two computers, one's at home and one's here, but this sounds like a solution to that problem. Well, your work life and personal life are out of balance if you're spending too much time at the office, yep. and that leads to stress, and stress leads to high blood pressure, yeah. and that can kill you. All kinds of other bad things. And so you don't want high blood pressure. No. So, you know, every time you get stressed, your BP goes up like 10 or so or more. Yeah, I do know that, actually. Not good. Here's the solution. You could stop working. You could. Which is not viable. Or, uh, or you could use Go to My PC. Right. Because we all know what this uh, stressful stuff is. Yeah, yeah. Go to My PC, you can access your home. Sorry, you can access your <laughs> office computer from home, right. so you have more control over when and where you work. Yep. Here's an example. Mm -hmm. Log on to your office computer before the kids wake up, so you're not rushing to the office in the morning. Or leave work mm -hmm. early to take the kids out, then finish your work after dinner. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. Yep. Our listeners can try Go to My PC free for 30 days. That's a month of unlimited remote access for free. For this special offer, visit www.gotomypc.com slash podcast. That's gotomypc.com slash podcast. You'll get a free 30-day trial. Nice. And we thank Citrix for their support of This Week in Virology. It's a good thing to support. It's educational. Absolutely. And we should say that the small amount of income <laughs> we accrue from <laughs> yes. this week from Citrix goes towards paying our costs. Exactly. We're not getting wealthy we're not making any money not yet we do this because we love to teach and um, this is true Dick this is basically son, true. Dixon <laughs> is the ultimate teacher the penultimate not penultimate the ultimate <laughs> the penned <laughs> ultimate <laughs> so let's go to um, nucleic acid synthesis we're going right. to call this twiv RNA synthesis 
And let's let's explain why we have, we need to do a little bit of background first. Sure. All life forms have DNA as their informational molecule. Indeed. Right. Indeed. It's a great informational molecule <coughs> because, as we've said before, the, the the code of life is in triplets of nucleotides, each triplet coding for an amino acid. But of course, as our cells divide, that DNA has to be duplicated. Yep. And that's a process worked out by Watson and Crick many years ago. And it's based, and DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is a great molecule to duplicate because it has this base equivalency, right? Right. A equals T, G, C equals G, which Erwin Chargaff here figured out many years ago. And that means if you have a st DNA, as we know, is a double stranded molecule, and each strand is a sequence of bases. And if on one strand you have ATT, then the other will be TAA. So it's, we call that complementarity. And it makes for an easy way to duplicate that molecule, right? Right. So let's say you have a double-stranded DNA, and just before your cells divide, that has to duplicate. The strands separate, and each strand is then duplicated. Just by looking at the, there's an enzyme that duplicates it. It's called a DNA polymerase. It looks at the base. Ah, it's an A. Then I need to put a T to make a new strand. How does it's it know C? to do that, by the way, Vince? I mean, what's the mystery of that? That sounds like a mystery to me. Well, the, the polymerase, the enzyme, uh, is sliding along this DNA, mm -hmm. and it's been unwound by another enzyme. Right. And uh, <laughs> this is the base that it has an active site, which we'll talk about. Uh, of the enzyme, and the base that's about to be copied sits in that active site. And actually, it's, uh, it's a hit or miss. It tries a couple of different ones, and only the uh, right one works. So the final say is by the base pair, not by yeah, the Yeah, so the enzyme. base pair, the highest energy, the right pair, AT or CG, Got it. boom, it goes ahead. The other ones, the enzyme said, nah, no good. Yeah. Um, because, you know, these four triphosphates, ATP, CTP, GTP, and TTP, the precursors of DNA, they're just floating around, exactly. and they're popping in and out of the active site very, very quickly. Apparently right. so. I mean, DNA replication zips along. That's right. <laughs> like Faster than Lee Hood can sequence it. <laughs> That's right. And so it's really, these, these things are popping in and out, and the best one goes forward. Right. So DNA is nice to duplicate, but viruses now mm. have either DNA or RNA genomes, if you right. recall. Of course. Now, many of the principles of replication is this, are the same. So we're going to use this word replication. So I've said duplication of DNA so far, but really we call it replication. Right. And so that's the term I'd like you to be familiar with. We right. need to replicate our DNAs, and viruses need to replicate their DNA or RNA. All right, so viruses can have DNA or RNA as nucleic acids. Today we're going to focus on viruses with RNA right? because... Um, it's too much to do all in one session. But you'll remember we also had another session where we discussed the, uh, the end result of how the virus uses its genome in order to replicate, and that is it all has to stream towards messenger RNA. Absolutely. And in fact, we're going to see that again today because okay. we're going to use that as a rubric because it's incredibly powerful. So yes. it, it leads me to ask the question, I meant to ask it last time we were discussing this, and that is that if it's easiest... For a virus to walk in with its own RNA that's already the message, why haven't all the viruses adopted that as their strategy? Why hasn't nature selected that for the main way the viruses conduct business? Well, that's a great question because it often... Because the rest <laughs> looks clumsy to me. I, you know, when we put this Baltimore scheme with the seven types of genome yeah. going, you could say, well, why doesn't just one... Exactly. Could, we don't have an answer to this, but my... Not. My feeling is they're all evolutionarily satisfactory. They uh, all work. Apparently so. One doesn't have any advantage. Apparently so. So you might say, well, retroviruses, they start with an RNA. Exactly. Where you can make lots of mistakes and yeah. have diversity, which is good for evolution. Uh-huh. And then you make it into DNA, which becomes a permanent part of the cell. <laughs> right. So why doesn't that last forever? <laughs> when, sorry, why doesn't that predominate? Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. So the answer must be, and it's not a satisfactory answer, I know, that the, all the forms of genomes must yeah. work. I, I, I used to think of evolution uh, equivalent to a safe cracker who was sitting at a safe mm -hmm. in which there was no police. <laughs> and someone was just <laughs> sticking food under the door, and the safe cracker was sitting there at the safe just trying to open it. But given enough time, of course, it will. So sure. 
every one of these viruses is a example of a successful safe cracker. That's right. And they all did it differently so because the safe number was different. That's, you're absolutely right. Okay. And they're all they all were successful okay. or else we wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, well, yeah. What would you say? You put all the viral genomes together from the ocean and they stretch out 200 light years? Yes, correct. 200 light years, Vince? That's an enormous length of space. Yes, it's huge. I can't get my head around that one. That's an well, incredible th figure. That's a whole other story. Wow. That's why we work on viruses. Hey. <laughs> and that's why I'm totally mystified by this whole area. <laughs> now, here are a couple of things we need to establish. First yep. of all, as you, as we've already said, said cells, m mammalian cells, other, any kind of living cell can replicate its own DNA. It has enzymes to do that. Cells can also make RNA from DNA, as you know, messenger RNA and other kinds of RNA. They have enzymes to do that. But cells cannot make RNA from RNA. Right. At least they cannot take a long RNA that's like a viral genome and make a copy of it. So the enzymes to do that are unique to viruses. Mm -hmm. So that's really something to keep in mind mm -hmm. as we talk about this because that means that every virus that has RNA as its genetic information has to have its own enzyme to copy that RNA. Right. But that's a bit of a burden, yep. right? Yep, it's an expense. Because as we'll see in a future... Virology 101, there are some viruses with DNA genomes that don't have to encode any enzymes because they <laughs> use all the enzymes of the cell. They can be very small and efficient, but these RNA viruses can't do that, okay? No. All right. Let's go over just a tiny bit of RNA history. Yep. 1935, tobacco mosaic virus was crystallized. Crystal. Wendell Stanley made little crystals. You know, you can take salt. Yeah. in water and saturate it, the solution and it will right. make crystals That's right. and you can do the same with viruses yep. in 1936 it was found that in those crystals there's 5% RNA hmm. Hmm. Now, nobody knew what to make of that because people didn't even at that point understand that DNA was genetic material that wasn't something that came about until 1944 McLeod, Avery McLeod McCarty experiment showing that DNA is the genetic material mm -hmm structure of DNA 1953 and it wasn't until 1956 when I was a wee three years old <laughs> that the uh, RNA in tobacco mosaic virus was shown to be infectious in mm. other words you could purify that RNA from the virus mm. insert it into cells and it would give rise to an infectious cycle so it showed that RNA can be genetic material right and now, of course, we know this. It's obvious, but it's important to know that at some point in the past, we didn't understand this. And huge controversies and lots of contentious behavior and absolutely, you know, secretive the things. I mean, I'm sure you've read the book Double Helix, and yeah. it's got lots of uh, gossip and the Double Helix. Yeah, I don't think we've ever picked that, but that well, might, I just did. That might be a great pick for today, Dick. <laughs> I just picked. Excellent. It. Who wrote that? I was written by Watson and Crick. Excellent. Right? Yeah, I did read that when I was a kid. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the way, I was 16 when you were three. <laughs> I should have known better. I should have been you studying were the, this. Were you the bully? I, me no, around? I wasn't the bully, actually. I was No, I wasn't that kid. Come on. You know better than that. <laughs> I was a 98-pound weakling. <laughs> From uh, Hoboken? Dumont, New Jersey. Dumont. 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 I had a good friend in Dumont. Yeah. Okay, so let's now start with our um, Baltimore scheme again. Right. You remember this, Dick? I do, but you're showing it clearly on the screen, and I'm sure that everyone will see this once our website goes up with this episode. Seven classes of viral it's, genomes. It looks simple when you express it like this. That's the that's the beauty of rubrics such as this, yes. right? Well, once you see the pattern. Patterns are important. What do we call that? Reductionism? Well, uh, not yeah. necessarily. <laughs> seeing patterns. <laughs> it's called seeing patterns. That's <laughs> right. <seeing> patterns. <laughs> and there is a pattern to all this, so that's the beauty of that part of it. Well, that's the neat thing with viruses. There's so many, and people get bewildered. But in right. fact, there's, there are patterns that you can use to really sort it out and make it quite simple. I mean, you could make a Venn diagram out of this. You could this make would, a Venn diagram. This would be quite beautiful. Absolutely. And you could weight the Venn diagram according to the number of viruses that mm -hmm. we know of that use each of these strategies. Has anybody ever done that, Vince? I'm not aware, but uh, it's a great idea. Because that gives maybe. you the overall evolutionary picture of the way life evolves. In terms of viruses, at least. Are you saying viruses are living? No, but they do evolve, don't they? They do evolve, yes. All right. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about 
three of these seven classes. We're going to right. talk, remember, mRNA is in the middle. Right. We are going to talk about viruses with positive strand, single stranded RNA genomes, like mm -hmm. poliovirus. Mm -hmm. We are going to talk about viruses with single stranded negative sense RNA genomes, like influenza virus. Two very, very important viral groups. Exactly. And finally, we will talk about viruses with double stranded RNA genomes. Also important, you know, the, um, the rotaviruses, very ah. important causes of gastroenteritis oh have yes. genomes like that. Yep. All right, so those are three. But you may see here that there is another class mm -hmm. of viruses with plus stranded RNA, and those are the retroviruses. Those are the conundrums of virology. Yeah, could you lower your mic just like an inch? I could. That's excellent. How's Very that good. one? Beautiful. Okay. Those viruses go through a DNA intermediate, so that's a whole different ball game. We're going to do a whole virology 101 on them. All right. Excellent. So we won't talk about those today. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. No problem. Here are two rules that are extremely important when we're talking about r RNA replication. First, an RNA must be copied end-to-end -end with no loss of sequence. Dick, you may say, that's obvious, Vince. Why are you telling me this? Well, sometimes the obvious parts are what we don't consider. <coughs> you got a, got a cold, Dick? No. You okay? I'm fine. You don't have T. spiralis, do you? <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't be acting like this. <laughs> I cooked my pork really well yesterday. Oh, good. You had pork on Thanksgiving. Well, actually, no one ate it. <laughs> it was part of the stuffing. No, I cooked this big rib thing, and it's beautiful. And, and no one ate it. No, nobody wanted it. It's you should have brought it in. We would have had it for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna home. I'm gonna go home and have it for lunch. Ah, today. good idea. All right, the RNA genome must be copied end to end with no loss of sequence. Okay, so the the enzymes have to start at the ends, right. not in the middle, right, or not near the ends. You can't lose a base or two or three. You have if you to do, copy of course, everything. you won't succeed as exactly. a viral particle. Yeah. So there's obviously evolutionary pressure <laughs> to maintain the Lots. an enzyme that can do that. So how does it know when it's made a complete sequence? Uh, my view is, Dick, that it. There's nothing else to copy. <laughs> it runs out of space it and there's nothing left. It goes the right to the end. done and that's the end. That's it. It runs to the end, it falls off, and Got that's it. it. Okay. How does it know where to begin? Well, we'll talk about that. That's an important one, too. That's I more to, regular. I to ask thing. that as well. All right. And then the second issue is we have to be able to make mRNAs. Right. So you have to duplicate the genome without loss of sequence, and you have yep. to make mRNAs. And all viruses need to do that. No exceptions. All right. Now, here's a just a tiny bit of history again. Because this is actually fascinating. It turns out that a man named David Baltimore <laughs> was uh, among the first to discover that viruses could duplicate their RNAs. He showed it biochemically, as we say. And I'm going to show you an experiment, Dick. It's a very old experiment from the early 1960s when David Baltimore was a graduate student. I was at Rockefeller. At Rockefeller. I was there while he was a graduate student. So he worked I with... Richard Franklin? Is yes. that the man's name? Do you mm, remember that name? I don't. Sorry, I don't. I think that might have been his name. Anyway, what he did, he was working with poliovirus, and he would infect cells, and then he would add to those cells. Sorry, he would infect cells, and at different times after infection, he broke the cells open and made what we call an extract. What virus was he playing? Poliovirus. Polio, okay. Polio, which okay. had an RNA genome. It has okay. an RNA genome. Got it. He would break the cells open and make an extract. And then he would add to that extract the four triphosphates, oh, sure. ATP, GTP, CTP, and TTP. Mm -hmm. And one of them was radioactively labeled uh -huh. so that he could trace whatever was made from them, right? Right. That's how we used to do things. We used to use radioactivity to trace molecules and cells right? because we didn't have any other ways to do it. Right. So he made an extract of infected cells at different times after infection, and he added these triphosphates, mm -hmm. one of which was radioactively labeled, and then he he incubated the extract and said, what's what's being made? And he saw this, uh, this RNA being made. Mm -hmm. He called it RNA polymerase activity, and it started at about two to three hours <coughs> after infection, and right. then it peaked, and then it went away. And at the same time, pol infectious poliovirus was being made in the cells. Right. It's this little dotted line here. Yep. And he said, hmm, this, this means that um, 
there's RNA being made, but what's making it? Is the cell, at this point, people didn't know if the cell was making it or right. if the virus was. In fact, what they thought was that the cell was converting the viral RNA into DNA and then making more RNA <laughs> from it, well. which turned out to be wrong. But he did an experiment which shed light on it. What he did is he put a, a drug called actinomycin D oh, yes. in his extract. Do you know oh, what yes. that does? I do, actually. It prevents RNA synthesis by DNA dependent RNA polymerases of the cell. Yes, I've actually used that drug myself in some experiments that I've been done. Right. So this is specific for cellular enzymes. And so he reasoned, well, if this poliovirus RNA is being made by a cell enzyme, then this drug should inhibit it. <coughs> right. What do you think he found on poliovirus RNA synthesis? It still went on. It still went on. It was not affected. Nope. By this drug, so because he said. The host hmm. wasn't doing it. The host is not doing it. He said it must be a viral enzyme, and that was the beginning. Hmm. And then he went further. He took that to discover reverse transcriptase many years later, because he was thinking about viral enzymes. Right. right? So this uh, was the first evidence that some RNA viruses can have this kind of enzyme, and later it was mm -hmm. discovered in mm -hmm. in other RNA viruses as well. And now we actually have crystal structures of these polymerases we know incredible detail yep how they work here's some terminology dick mm -hmm. the replicase <coughs> is yes. what people used to say was the enzyme that copies viral rna to produce genomes replicase mm -hmm. because it replicates the genome mm -hmm. here's another one transcriptase mm -hmm. ace coming from enzyme right of course the enzyme that makes mrna Transcription actually is copying DNA into RNA. So for RNA viruses, we don't use that word, but many people do. Mm. Not correct. Mm. And a promoter mm. are se is a sequence controlling the transcription of DNA templates. So yes. promoter and transcription we don't use for RNA viruses, I'm sorry to say. Well, well. But many people will. C'est la vie. So we have both plus and minus strand RNA viruses. And knowing just that will will get us a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Now, plus-stranded viral genomes can be translated. Right. Because they're positive. They stranded. are the message. They are the message. So they, viruses with that polarity genome, they don't have to carry an enzyme in the cell with them because it's encoded in the genome. So a, a, a virus like poliovirus, which is positive-stranded, it has the capsid and it has the RNA inside, and that's it. When that virus infects a cell, the first thing that happens is the RNA is translated into protein, and one of those proteins is the enzyme that will copy the genome. And the host machinery does all the work. Host machinery does all the work. So virus the boss walks in and hires the help, and <laughs> the next <laughs> thing you right. know, they're getting their own product And back. you may say, Dick, that sounds like the simplest way. Why doesn't that predominate? But the other way, which is if you have a negative strand genome like influenza virus, you have to make another strand first. You have to make another strand. When that negative strand gets yeah. into the cell in, in infection, <coughs> cell has no clue what to do with this, right? Exactly. Because it, uh, it can't be translated. It's not message. And there's no enzyme in the cell to copy that negative strand into a plus strand. Now, it's too bad that there's no host enzyme sitting there waiting to destroy it because then the virus wouldn't succeed. There are, and, and we shall talk about those in the future. Okay. But the viruses have evolved to of, abrogate of that. Of course they have. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise they wouldn't exist, right? Right. So negative strand viruses, Dick, if the negative strand virus has to be first copied, mm. what does it carry into the cell in the virion? Well, it must have a replicase that uh, mm. does exactly. this. Exactly. It actually has enzymes that will um, copy that negative strand RNA yep. into plus strands. Yep. An RNA polymerase. So this is a, a rule. If your virus is plus-stranded RNA, it doesn't take anything into the cell with it. If it's negative strand, it brings in an enzyme, always. Now, what about double-stranded RNA, Dick? Um, let me think. Um, gee, it has an option of going both ways, doesn't it? Well, it's got the plus strand yeah. and the minus strand, right? Right. You would think it could be just translated, right? The, the plus might be translated? Or yeah. if you thought that, though, you'd be wrong. I, I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a trick question, everybody. <laughs> because double-stranded RNA cannot be translated. Only single-stranded RNA. Cell doesn't know it, what to do with double-stranded RNA. So it's it still has to make its own. So it comes in with its own polymerase also. Exactly. And it makes messenger RNA. Isn't that cool? Now, what about the RNA polymerases? Are they uh, similar for all these other stranded viruses? Dick, I'm glad you asked that. We will 
get to that. Okay. They are all similar. Uh -huh. So here are some universal rules for RNA synthesis. It begins and ends at specific places. That makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Here's an interesting one. Maybe it's, this is a little complicated, but we're going to throw it out there. RNA polymerases, the enzymes that copy RNA, can, can initiate the synthesis with or without a primer. Now, Dick, you know DNA synthesis needs a primer. You need a little molecule to get the enzyme going. Sure. It's actually a small piece of yeah, yeah. nucleic acid that sits down on the DNA, and then the enzyme uses that to get going. It's, it's like starting your zipper when you it's got to... Starting your zipper, and it tells the enzyme where to start, basically. Of course, of course right. it does. So RNA polymerases can work with or without those. Some do, some need primers, and some don't, as we will see. And then you make nucleic acid, in this case RNA, from 5 to 3 prime. Okay. So d nucleic acids have a polarity, not just plus or minus, but a direction, 5 prime and 3 prime ends. It's a chemical issue probably right. more than we can than we can get into here. But these nucleic acids are always synthesized from 5 to 3 prime, and mm -hmm. the, the template's always copied in a 3 to 5 prime direction. So it's red from 3 to 5 prime, and it's made, the new material is made f in a 5 to 3 prime direction. Right. Now, your question is excellent. There are four different kinds of nucleic acid polymerases, right? There's DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, there's DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. There's RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is the subject of this TWIB. Mm -hmm. And then there's RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. Sounds like a Punnett square. <laughs> <laughs> Retro, <laughs> sorry, reverse transcriptase. Right. What is a Punnett square? It's a way to express the genetic possibilities of two different That's organisms right. that cross. You're right. I knew that. I knew you, you knew that. Put the alleles <laughs> on the top and on the That's side. Right. And, and then you get you all the come different up with genotypes. Then here you go. So these four polymerases are all related. They have sequence homologies and their amino acid sequences. Their crystal mm -hmm. structures have all been determined, and they're all looking like a, a right hand. Look at that. So the analogy is they're a right hand because <coughs> they have what's called a palm domain, Yes. which is where all the uh, activity occurs. Okay. They have thumb, a distinct thumb. The palm is the active site then? Palm is the active okay. site. You have thumb and fingers domains, which right. do various it, other uh, things. Physical structure. So yeah. that lends the question then, if they have a similar active site, and there's sequence homologies between them, then certain drugs might affect a whole group of viruses, if it could act at the pocket. Yeah, so it turns out not to be the case. Darn. Because they're sufficiently different that each one needs its own drug, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So but there are drugs that do interact at that level? There are drugs that inhibit polymerases, absolutely. There uh -huh. are. Now, of course, if your virus uses a, a host polymerase that you can't inhibit. No, it. but I mean, I'm talking about the RNA. RNA viruses? Yeah. You know, in theory, that should work. That's a very good point. Because these are unique enzymes to the virus, exactly. then you should be able to inhibit them you should. with drugs. You should. And there are, people have come up with inhibitors. So for the re for the retroviruses, there yeah. are many inhibitors of the reverse transcriptase. Those are beautiful sure. antivirals. Yep. They're the nucleoside and the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Right. But, um, you know, for RNA viruses, there just aren't that many. There's one in development for influenza virus at the moment. That would be a good one. Um, I believe there's one in development for hepatitis C virus, hmm. but that's it. There's nothing licensed for any, no RNA polymerase inhibitors licensed for any virus, RNA virus, except the retrovirus. Seems like a good target. But it is a great target. Part, part of the problem, Dick, of course, is that uh, for most of these RNA virus infections, you can't diagnose them until it's too late. Mm. Flu is an exception because mm. now we have rapid diagnost diagnostic kits, even though they're not very good accuracy, but mm. for a common cold, for other viruses, it's difficult when they're over so quickly. But anyway, that's a great target, it is. Okay, Dick? It's fine. So let's go through just a couple of these um, different <coughs> configurations and talk about how the genome replicates. Let's start for, with viruses with a plus-stranded plus genome. Strand. And we're going to look first at the Flavy and the well, Picorna viruses, two viruses close to us. Some old friends. Flavies being... Yellow fever type viruses. West Nile. Sure, West Nile, the dengue group. Right, and po coronas being polio and rhinoviruses. Exactly. 
These are very simple. Those poor rhinos, you know. I keep thinking about them every time I hear this. <laughs> why, are you, why are they poor? <laughs> you know, a rhino. They've got their own viruses. <laughs> oh, no, that's just a bad rhi- joke, everybody. That's rhinoceros. a bad joke. Rhinoceros. Dick, yeah. what does rhino mean? <clears throat> I guess nose. Yeah. Why do they call rhinoceros? Because it has a Big horn one. on its nose, but that doesn't figure, you know. that Take away its horn, it's not a nosy-like animal. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't got a... true. One of those It's not like one of those proboscis monkeys that you can see with a giant nose. Rhinovirus. Whatever. So they have a, a plus stranded genome. It's one piece of RNA. Right. And all it has to do is remember when it gets in the cell because it's plus stranded, it's translated first. It's right off. Right off. And one, among the proteins that are made is the uh, RNA dependent among RNA. Among the polymers. proteins that are made. That's right. right. It's not just a single protein. Yeah, it makes about a dozen. So what about TMV, the simplest of all of them? TMV does the same thing. It encodes its own polymerase. It gets in the cell. It's translated. How many proteins? I don't know the number, Dick. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's a, well, don't be sorry. We can um, look it up. We could look it up, <laughs> but we don't want to we, interrupt No, it. of course not. But uh, the, 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 it makes a dozen. Polio makes a dozen proteins. Wow. And um, one of those is the polymerase, which will eventually make more RNAs. But the first thing that happens is translation. Mm. And the genome is copied. Now, Dick, if you have a plus-stranded RNA, mm-hmm. and you have to make... A complete copy of it. What's the polarity of that copy? I guess it goes from five prime to three prime. What's the polarity though? If you start with plus, you mean negative. It's, it's negative. negative. Of course, it's so negative. you make a negative copy of the whole thing. Sure. Which is nothing but a copy. Right. It doesn't do anything. It's not made into protein. It doesn't go into virions exactly. for these viruses. Exactly. It's just a template. It's interesting that you have to do this, but. Well. That's the cost. Right? I love watching these home building shows, and they make these uh, <laughs> <laughs> these jigs to make a certain angle cut. You know, and mm-hmm. Norm is out there with his uh, circular saw. Same thing. And you throw the jig away when you finish. The negative strand is of no use as far as we know. That's right. Who knows what we know and what is real. Uh, well, uh, exactly. But they're right. This is a jig, and that's all it's for. Sure. Um, and then you take that and you copy it and you make a plus strand, and then you can put those into viruses. You can translate it. Now you're off and running. And it's very simple. Yep. Now there are other fu- there are other plus stranded RNA viruses that work a little bit differently, uh-huh. like alpha viruses. Do you know what they are? No, but you're going to tell me. So they're, <laughs> they're part of this toga virus family, which Togo. are, which are toga generally virus. insect-borne viruses. Okay. A fam- these are Western equine encephalitis uh-huh. virus, equine e- Eastern encephalitis, but Venezuelan. Are these are no, they're alphas. Chikungunya is an alpha virus. Okay. Very similar structures, okay, but enough different enough right. that they're placed in a different group. This is actually a group of alpha viruses. Very good. They have a plus stranded RNA genome, mm. which can be translated right mm-hmm. as soon as it gets into a cell, and that's made more of by going through a negative strand complement, right? Just like the picornaviruses, mm-hmm. and then the negative strand is used to make more genomes. So I sense a stoichiometry to all of this also as the viral particle, let's say, attaches, decodes, enters, Mm -hmm. the uh, viral replication process begins. Right. Uh, In the beginning, you get a lot of template made, and then you start to get a lot of positive stranded RNA RNA molecules made, and along with that, the proteins that are going to self-assemble at the end of this thing to let the virus out. Right. So when David Baltimore conducted his original research, Mm -hmm. he was dealing with huge uh, numbers of populations of both positive and negative stranded RNA as the virus starts its replication cycle. Mm -hmm. So how did he sort those two things out? Well, that's a good question. First, the the, the interesting thing is that you make much more, in those viruses, you make much more plus-strand RNA in cells than uh-huh. minus strands. So you don't need a lot of template to make more no, plus. so that minus strand is a jig, so you don't want to make more than you need, right? So h- that's the point then. How does it know how much is enough? This is a good question. How does it regulate how much of minus... Because it can't regulate anything. The host no. is all... It's got the machinery, right? Dick, that's the question that is extant. Is <laughs> one of the many questions. This is a mystery. It's a mystery, and it is one... If you look <laughs> in our, my textbook... <laughs> There's a section on how do, how do we regulate plus versus minus, and we really yeah. don't know. One of the obvious answers is that... There must be some feedbacks. There's, yeah. some, there's some sequence at the end of the genome that regulates copying by this enzyme. Oh. And one of the ideas is that in the minus strand, uh, in the plus strand, it's not very efficient to make minus strands, but uh-huh. in the minus Why strand, it's very efficient. So it's sort of like... 
Right. You can make plus. it's easier to make a lot of plus from minus than right. minus from plus, but it's a simplistic answer, and we don't yeah. actually know how it works Got for it. some other viruses that's been looked at, but not for these. Uh -huh. Okay, so those are two families that make um, RNAs. As soon as uh, they don't have an enzyme in the particle, but they're translated, and then some of the proteins made mm -hmm. uh, go on to to replicate the genomes. And this is, I'm just showing you a picture here, Dick, of the, I love the coronavirus pictures. genome to show it's a big <laughs> RNA and it's made right. into a bunch of proteins. Yep. Now, uh, one, one no interesting. No introns, right? No introns. Uh, no intervening sequences. Viruses no. don't have those, do they? Uh, DNA, some DNA viruses do. Do they yes. really? So where'd they get those from? That's another question, of course. But, I mean, we always assume ours came from incomplete mm -hmm. viral replications or retroviruses or stuff, all of our introns. I don't know. That's a good and question. They the, were there first. The though, viruses right? that have introns. <laughs> viruses have viruses? <laughs> actually, some RNA viruses have intr Influenza virus uh, does do splicing. It doesn't actually have an intron, but it does splice. So um, this raises, of course, several other spurious questions that have nothing to do with this presentation, but it might. So you have two plus-stranded RNA viruses, different, and you throw an equal amount <clears throat> into the cell mix, and they both get taken up by the same cell. Now their RNA polymerases start to uh, compete with each other. Yeah. Which one wins? Oh, wow, that's a good question. It depends on the virus, because viruses do other things to cells to... Uh, I mean, polio and influenza are found side by side in many places throughout the world. That's a very good question. And here you've got both of them competing for the same host machinery. Which one overrides the system? It really depends, because polio can do a lot of things to the cell, which it ends up blocking other viruses. Hmm. See, what I'm driving at is that maybe there's a virus <clears throat> sitting out there someplace that actually shuts off the invader virus. And Absolutely. Can, then you can might, maybe you can make use of that to actually prevent fusion. Well, yes. Something. In fact, there are... Um, like viral therapy to cure viruses. <laughs> so, so for some retroviruses, for example, when one retrovirus gets in, it then does things to the cell to prevent other retroviruses from infecting because it wants the sole use of the cell to Abs itself. You bet. And people study this for the reason you point out so uh -huh. we can learn how to interfere with right. multiplication. Maybe an incomplete virus might Absolutely. be perfect for this situation. And uh, we'll probably get to that at some point because we're going to be doing this in perpetuity. In perpetuity. <laughs> that means for as long as we can speak. As long as we can speak. Now, one thing that most people will probably not be aware of is that when uh, RNA viruses make RNA we're using these viral enzymes, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, they don't just do it floating around in the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm doesn't look like that anyway, Vince. Yeah, I know. You're this big proponent of a highly structured cytoplasm. It's an ecosystem it is. of molecules. And so these things are not just floating around, but they're on very specific structures. You betcha. And you, these are actually Clusters. membrane vesicles. Yep. So for polio... What happens is when the virus infects the cell, yep. it, it totally messes up the membrane system of the cell, and it makes all these little vesicles. They're, Look at that. You see them in this nice picture. It makes all these vesicles. We would call those microsomes in another world. In another world, you could call them, but they're distinctly different. And it's on the surface of those vesicles that the viral RNA polymerase is duplicating the viral RNAs. How does it do that? Do what part of it? How does it create all those tiny vesicles out of what is it coming from, the endoplasmic uh, Well, this is a, for polio, this is a bit contentious. The origin of these vesicles was <coughs> thought, you know, in the cell you have transport of vesicles from the ER to the Golgi and then to the cell And surface. lysosomes, don't forget those. Lysa and, and some people believe that the vesicles originate from that pathway. What does the membrane look like? It's actually a double membrane vesicle, which more resembles autophagosomes. I don't know if you know what those oh, of are. Of course I do. So when mm. cells are stressed... Of course I do. I said like I, just said like I do. No, no but actually fine. I do know what that is. So <laughs> when cells are stressed, they form these double membrane sure. autophagosomes, which basically are to try and digest the cell and recycle contents so they can be used by another cell. That's right. It's sort of a defense mechanism. And the idea is that, and this is, I'm more convinced that this is the origin of these vesicles. Our, my good friend Carla Kierkegaard, uh, is a proponent of this idea that Any they originally from to the other Kierkegaard? No, not that I know oh, of, okay. but maybe actually. That's an unusual name. Yes, uh, yeah, actually, I've asked her that, but I've forgotten the answer. <laughs> <laughs> she gave you some philosophical answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, she may. Be, I'm not sure. Some existential. No, that's not. I'll correct. ask her. Um, 
these originate from autophagosomes, so polio infects the cell. It stimulates uh, the formation of autophagosomes, and then the virus uses them to replicate its genome on the surface. It's brilliant, but this is what we should know from... from wow. Now, at the same time, can host synthesis of normal proteins go on? Well, polio, in fact, in, in all the pocornas, shuts that off. Right, and this might be the way. Uh, no, it's different. Okay. Different from this. I see. We'll, we'll have to get to that in another session. All right. But all RNA viruses modify the membranes in the cell to some extent to do this. They don't always use autophagosomes. They use other membranes. And, in fact, for a plant virus, there's a very nice study where they, they've shown that you can make the RNA polymerase go to a different kind of vesicle, and it will still work. So oh. it's apparently not the particular composition of the vesicle, but just that it's a membrane surface. So we, we used to refer to this as a virus factory. Is that still a term that you could use? You could use it because you see here there are lots of virus particles sure, being sure. made here. Yep. Um, now this will be a little obscure to many readers, but what the take-home message... <laughs> <laughs> listeners. Sorry. Hopefully listeners that also read. The, um, the idea is that basically that in a cell, the RNA synthesis that viruses undertake doesn't happen randomly. It happens on the surface of very, mm -hmm. very small vesicles. And we'll put a picture of this in the show notes so you can see what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, why do you think you would? You may say, "Who cares where it happens?" Oh. Well, if if you really understand the mechanisms, <coughs> the fundamentals, how it works, then you can always think about interfering. You That's can. what we're always working towards with viruses. The best knowledge comes from knowing everything, and then you can design better drugs. All right. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on to another kind of virus now. All right, we've done through the plus strand viruses, and w th these these alpha viruses are a bit different, but I don't want to get into it because we want to move on to the uh, negative strand viruses now. Right. And this includes two kinds. There are negative strand RNA viruses where the RNA is one molecule, like a rabies virus, mm -hmm. and then there are ones with segmented RNAs like influenza virus, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Influenza has yes. a segmented yes, RNA yes, yes, genome. Yes. But it's always the same. The genome is negative-stranded RNA. It cannot be translated. It's got to be copied into mRNA, and that's done by a viral enzyme that the virus brings into the cell with it. Remarkable. Always. So it's part of the viral capsid? It's inside the viral capsid. Inside the viral yes. capsid. So rabies, vesicular stomatitis virus, mm -hmm. within the capsid, there's a viral enzyme associated mm -hmm. with the RNA. Mm -hmm. Influenza, within that influenza particle that's infecting you, not only is there segmented RNA genome, but there is RNA polymerase in each virus particle. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. And that RNA polymerase, as soon as the RNA gets into the cell, begins churning out RNAs. Now, in these two viruses, the mRNAs are slightly different <laughs> from the full-length copy of the minus strand. Now, that's a bit hard, I know, but let's just look at, say, uh, rabies virus or measles or these viruses with negative strand genomes. Mm -hmm. We have a long negative strand RNA. Mm -hmm. These, um, so what could happen is this negative strand RNA could be copied to a plus strand. In this so that's cell. a 3 to 5 prime rather than a 5 to 3 that's prime, right. as we were just talking that's right. about before. That's right. Because this is the opposite copy. It's the copy. opposite strand, so this is copied. It's a mirror image, so to speak. Now this could be copied into a full-length plus strand, and then it could be made into a long protein like polio, which would be chopped up, but it doesn't work that way with these viruses. These viruses make a me one mRNA for each protein. So really? rabies has one, two, three, four, five oh. different proteins. Well, this is more host cell-like than the other. It's more host cell-like, and it makes individual messenger RNAs for each of them. So it doesn't have to worry about chopping it up afterwards. It doesn't have to worry about chopping it up. So it takes that, I that it negative strand RNA that comes in the cell, with its enzyme, the enzyme makes little mRNAs from each one. Very cool. It just starts at one end, and it goes boom down the RNA, and it makes one mRNA. Then it stops, and then it starts and makes another, and it makes another all the way down the line. And each of those mRNAs make proteins. And it's of course, the proteins system. to make new viruses and enzymes. Yeah, it's like looking at a simplified host cell. It is sort of. This is much more host cell-like because these messenger RNAs are very much like those that. Can you get in all this cell. to work in a sulfur extract? Yes, you can. Uh -huh. You absolutely can. That's how a lot of the uh -huh. understanding of this has been done. It can be done in cell-free extracts. Okay. In fact, Dick, if you take the purified, say, vesicular stomatitis or influenza virions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you put them in, in vitro with some triphosphates and a little magnesium, yeah. they will make RNA. About absolutely. That. So, Dick, you see, we make all these messenger RNAs. 
they are not complete copies of the negative strand, right? No, no. You can see they're not. But what's the one of the rules that we have to do when we're replicating RNA? Do it from end to end. Got to do end to end. So that's not fulfilling. You think that this that the virus then tacks all these mRNAs together to make a full length? Of course plus? not. Of course, of course not. not. There's another set of reactions. <laughs> oh, but of course. Where this <laughs> negative strand is copied into a full length plus strand. Wow. And that is actually another sort of jig to use your nice analogy because mm -hmm. that's never used for anything except making more minus strands. Right. So for these viruses, the negative strand is the important thing. It's what's in the virus. The mRNAs are important because that's from which proteins are made. Mm -hmm. But the plus strand, the full-length plus strand is a jig. The right. virus just uses yeah. that to make more minus so strands. So I need to ask you of course. an ecological question now because you've raised the issue of rabies. So rabies is a normal viral inhabitant in bats. Now, not all species of bats have it, but a lot of them do. Correct. And in their cells, this process is going on all the time without killing the bat. That's now, right. does this replicate in bat nervous tissue, or does it replicate somewhere else? Because in us, it's a nervous tissue. It's a, a, it's a tropic uh, virus for our nervous system. Yeah, Dick, I'm, I, I'm afraid to say I don't know the answer. I would guess that I it's bet you not, somebody out there does, though. <laughs> I, I would guess that it's not replicating in bat nervous tissue. Otherwise, they would have issues. Uh, right? I would. This is correct. So the point that I'm trying to raise here, and then, is that in one species, a virus is neurotropic, and another species, of a virus is the same virus, in another host species, is not neurotropic. Yes. Then if we could discover what the difference was between our two biologies and in some way um, develop a, a scheme to direct the virus somewhere else besides our nervous tissue. Absolutely. Dick, the whole rabies the whole would not be a lethal... You're function. absolutely right. The whole issue of where viruses grow in different hosts is incredibly important for that reason. Because I mean, if, you, if there's a difference from one host to another and you can figure out why, it gives you more intervention of options. Of course. All this is anthropocentric. Everything we're discussing here is from the perspective of humans. That's right. And making so rabies is like 80% fatal in humans. Uh, it, most of it is driven by wanting to make us healthier. That's right. In but which means in nature, this infection. is not a lethal virus. For bats, it's not often lethal, although no. some bats do get sick. But Those are, those I, are the wrong bats. My guess is my, <laughs> it's the wrong bats. It's, yeah, it's, it's true. Like people are the wrong hosts. No, that's exactly right. We're accidental. So, uh, yeah, when you have an accident. So how host, does the normal host control the pathology of this Don't infection? know the answer. I would love to know that You answer. know, Dick, I think rabies in bats is not a, a greatly studied issue. I'm sure you're right. It's probably not easy to keep bats in the lab to well, do these infections. It's pretty easy. To, actually, that's not so hard. No? Not so hard. People have colonies of bats in the laboratory? Well, you can't... St it's very hard to study rabies <sighs> in the lab because it's, it's extremely very, dangerous. And it's also... There's a mnemonic version of it that's uh, not so good. So either. I'm not aware of right. anybody doing that. But I know there are some listeners who work on rabies, so yeah, you, yeah. Could, you could let us know. Um, we do actually have a fellow at University of Maryland who's going to join us at, in a future... Uh, hmm. And he's looking at uh, rabies... Or what kinds of viruses are in bats... In the oh, wild. Excellent. So it would be interesting to know. But it's an interesting question of why it kills some animals yeah. and not others. Yeah, we just yeah. don't know the answers. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't want to. It doesn't want to, of course. Evolutionarily well, speaking. Yeah, I mean, in general, I think it's reasonable to assume that the virus doesn't want to eliminate all its hosts. So it reaches some balance, which sort of is parasitic, right? It is. Yeah, Dick. <laughs> Let's do two more viruses and then we'll... We'll wrap this Vince, up. I must interrupt you for yeah, one yeah, moment sure. and tell you that if you think I'm a good teacher, I think you're a wonderful teacher, and mm -hmm. and this is the way to learn it. Well, I tell you what I'm this doing. Like we're doing this one on one. Actually, I'm looking at the same visuals that Vince is looking at as we speak. Right. So I'm able to ask questions based on what goes up on the screen. When Vince right. gives his lectures to the medical students, which I've sat in on many of his presentations, and they're very, very straightforward, extremely easy to understand, mm -hmm. and yet they include all of these uh, uh, very, very complex uh, systems that he wants the students to learn. They don't get this opportunity no, to interrupt at the moment and say, you know, Vince, uh, what about this over here? Or, you know, what does this mean in terms of... So we're really looking at this as a wonderful opportunity to explore how a lecture is broken down on a specific topic in a way that makes it more interactive. 
So if I'm uh, not asking the right questions out there, people write in and tell me to ask more stupid questions. No, that's th <laughs> this is why the podcast format is good for this. Because, yeah, I love it. And I don't want to do it by myself. I, I wanted you to here be you. here because right, here you here. asked the questions. I'm trying to determine how to incorporate this into teaching. Right. Because I agree with you that getting up in front of a class isn't yeah, the most ideal way no, to do this. No, of course it isn't. It's very passive. So as you know, I'm teaching a new virology course I do. next semester. I and do. I would really like to be able to use – maybe I can do a live webcast. That would be good. And have students log in and, and oh. ask questions and interact while I'm doing it. Why not? Like that. So that's – anyway, what I'm doing here today, Dick, is I'm recording this screen as we yeah. – and it's going to be put up on the web That'll be as great. part of this. That would be great. So influenza virus uh -huh. has negative stranded RNAs, but it has eight of them. But eight. really, this what we just talked about happens for each of these eight segments. Wow. Pretty much. They're negative strands. Um, as soon as they get into the cell, the viral enzyme, the RNA polymerase that comes with them, makes an mRNA. What else? Of course. And the mRNA is not a complete copy of that negative strand, Dick. Yep. It's short at one end. Oh. So the virus it has to make a plus-stranded, full-length copy, a jig, <laughs> if you will. I love right. that analogy. That's beautiful because yeah. it's really not used for anything except as an intermediate. You have to make a tool. And then from that full-length plus-strand, it makes more minus-strands. Right. So from again, to re-summarize, the virus RNA is minus-stranded. It comes in the cell. It makes an mRNA, which is plus-stranded. Right. It can be made into proteins. Right. It's not a complete copy of the genome. Nope. So then the virus has to also take that negative strand and make a full-length plus strand. Exactly. And that's why I made this point early on that you have to make a complete copy yeah. of the genome. Because Otherwise you can't replicate yourself the next time, And there's some viruses right? that make mRNAs that are not complete sure. copies. So, so how does it divide the labor up between let's make a lot of proteins, let's make a lot of viral genome? Because that has to self-assemble at the end, doesn't it? It does. It has to regulate all of this. And it that's has to incredible. regulate how much messenger RNA... How much of each messenger RNA is made? How much full length plus strand? So, do you get a lot of incomplete viral synthesis because the regulation process isn't exact? Oh, that's a very good question. We do get defective particles made yes. for, for many of these viruses, but mm -hmm. we don't really understand why. And it may be that the whole process. Since screwed, is, I don't have to regulate this. Dick, I'll just make enough to get into the next cell. <laughs> here, look, we're on lecture three or four of Virology 101, yeah. and we still have a dozen more to go <laughs> just to get through the replicative cycle. Right. So anytime a, there's a screw-up, it's it. If you screw up at an early stage, Boop. nothing else happens. Nope. So that's probably why you make defective particles, because you have to be perfect at every step. And as you know, Dick, in life, nothing, or in, in viruses, nothing is perfect. So this, this, <laughs> this virus, that's true, this virus doesn't care about its waste dump. It seems not. It's not ecologically sound, Dick. No. It's just a brute strength approach. You walk in, you make your virus, you get out, and you leave all this destruction behind. D Dick, is, is nature ecologically sound? Yeah, it is, actually. Why? Why? Because it's economic. Hmm. I don't think it is, but we can talk about no, that another no, it, time. It, there's no waste. There's no such thing as waste. It's all recycled. This is nothing that's recycled here. This is a brute strength approach. Yeah, plus strand. That's that's the jig for these viruses. Yeah. Well, it may be degraded and reused. Who knows? Nobody really has looked into that. But it could be, Dick. All right, I'll give you that. All right, let's do the last class of viruses because this is quite illustrative, and that is the double-stranded RNA wow. viruses. And as I said before, these viruses have a double-stranded RNA in the particle, and that can't be translated in the cell. The cell needs single-stranded RNA. So right. these viruses have to bring in with them an enzyme that will make <laughs> messenger <laughs> RNA that can be copied into protein. And then they also have to duplicate their genomes to make more. So they take the plus strand, and they make a negative-stranded copy of it. Remarkable. And again, this is both by viral enzymes. Does this have a similar viral factory to the polio virus story? It does. Um, we know less about it, but yes, there are factories that uh, uh, in which these it viruses are It requires microsomal made. vesicles and stuff like that. It requires vesicles, yes. So this is not an intranuclear virus. No, these all of these actually. These are, these are all cytoplasmic viruses. I'm glad you asked me. They're all cytoplasmic, with the exception of influenza virus. <laughs> Now, influenza virus is very unusual in that it replicates its RNA in the nucleus of the cell. Do you want to go through why it does that? Of course. We have a few slides where we can explain that. I would like to know that. All right. So influenza virus RNA synthesis 
is inhibited by a drug that comes from a deadly mushroom. Amanita. Exactly. The drug is called alpha aminitin. Alpha aminitin is an inhibitor of cellular DNA dependent RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase. Yes, indeed. And this is an enzyme that has nothing to do with influenza <laughs> virus <laughs> RNA. So why should it inhibit influenza virus Precisely. RNA synthesis? Precisely. Well, it turns out that in, to make influenza virus messenger RNAs, the viral enzyme needs a primer. Mm. And that primer is derived from host cell messenger RNAs. Yeah, this, that's pol two. It's made by this pol two pol DNA two. dependent RNA polymerase, which is inhibited by alpha aminitin. Also known as the angel of death. The angel of death. So the virus needs those mRNAs. Yeah, yeah. And here, hence, it's susceptible to this drug. But, Dick, it's not yes. as simple as No, of that. course not. Nothing is that simple, is it? There's another family of viruses called buniviruses. Oh, yes. Those viruses also require priming of their mRNAs with host cell mRNAs. Mm -hmm. But they are not inhibited by alpha aminitin. They have escaped the uh, control mechanism. And the reason is that those viruses... Uh, Replicate in the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm. Not the nucleus. They use old pieces of mRNA. <laughs> they don't have to be freshly made in the nucleus, as does influenza virus RNA. So they use a, sav uh, a salvage pathway. So uses to speak. old pieces where flu needs Do brand you know new synthesis? mRNAs that are made in the nucleus. Cool. But the other thing, Dick, is that flu RNA synthesis uh, requires splicing, and that may be the real <laughs> real reason because why of these it eight happens. pieces. Well, it just is a way of getting two proteins from a single messenger RNA. I switch. So it has to occur in the nucleus probably because of that. And it's uh, one of the viruses that, uh, one of the few viruses that, uh, RNA viruses that replicates in the nucleus. All the others are in the cytoplasm. Hmm. And you see, you didn't know you were going to get into that. I, I didn't know I was going to get into the virology 101, to be honest. But I'm glad that this so is that's, happening. So um, that's... That's, I think that's enough of RNA synthesis. Should we summarize? We, we should. So RNA viruses have to replicate their genomes like everything else. You bet. They have to use enzymes that they encode because cells don't know how to copy RNA virus right. RNA. Right. Those vi and if it, the virus is a plus-stranded RNA, it doesn't have to carry an enzyme in the cell nope. because the plus strand can be translated. But if the virus has a negative strand or a double-stranded RNA, it has to bring into the cell an enzyme to make the RNA that the cell can recognize. And some many viruses make mRNAs that are not complete copies of the genome, so they have mm -hmm. to make intermediates or jigs, as Dick called them, well, you know. to serve as templates. Any questions, Dick? Tons of them, but I think I've asked a lot already. All right, <coughs> can I read a few emails? Absolutely. I have an email from Ricardo, who hmm. writes, Hello, Vincent. He sent a link about H1N1 and Guillain-Barre syndrome, which mm -hmm. we'll post. Mm -hmm. It is impressive the amount of hate emails there are on H1N1 vaccines. In Portugal, there seems to be no issues about vaccination, at least until now. With all this hate mail, people are starting to ask if they should take the vaccines or not. Hmm. I just hope it doesn't spread to other vaccines. I've heard, I've heard a, from a few health-related workers that they won't take the vaccines because they have doubts about their safety. The worst thing is that most of the time the reason for that is just an email they have received. Right. So this is the problem with the Internet. It, it uh, empowers yeah. you to learn more, but you also get scared because there's a lot of misinformation out there. That's right. Like Ricardo. Uh, this is from Eric. Dear Vince and Dick, first allow me to thank you for putting together this wonderful program. Wow. I'm a medical student at Eastern Virginia Medical School and have enjoyed listening to the episodes on evenings when I finally put down my textbooks. <laughs> Some think it's strange, but TWIV is one of the places I turn when I can't study any longer. We I've helped also, to put you to sleep. <laughs> I've also enjoyed reading The Coming Plague as one of my pleasure books. Ah. I've long held an interest in virology and infectious diseases, and after I graduate, I would love to be working in the field. It is my belief that I will be more effective as an infectious disease physician if I am involved with the tracking and study of emergency infectious diseases. Yeah, yeah. I would be in a position to limit their spread by assisting with information gathering and epidemiology as well as assisting public health departments. Very true. Unfortunately, the daily routine of most infectious disease physicians seems to be filled with lurching from patient to patient mm -hmm. in order to manage cases of HIV, 
hepatitis, and antibiotic-resistant organisms. While this is an important role, I feel that I could do more by involving myself in the stages prior to the contraction of the infections. I was hoping you two might have some advice on how to bridge the gap between clinical medicine, public health, and virology research. Sure. Get a job with CDC. Yeah, Go for an EIS right. officer. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Or, EIS. Yeah, you could do that, or you could join uh, some NGO that uh, has uh, health outreach into various countries. Mm -hmm. You could do uh, volunteer work for Doctors Without Borders, or you could get uh, connected with WHO, go for an MPH degree, which gives you entree into that world. Uh, and then uh, do donate part of your time to traveling, you know, and um, get involved with some public health programs in places like India or China or uh, Southeast Asia to name just a few, of course, in Africa as well. And uh, you'll get big overviews of how infectious diseases affect mm -hmm. huge numbers of people, and that would be a great uh, experience for you to gather earlier than later on in your experience. It's probably after you finish your residency. Great. Good advice. I also asked Scott Hammer yep. about this. He's a physician oh, in yeah. infectious disease. He's chief of ID here. He's very famous and, for uh, his work on HIV. done here. a lot with HIV clinical trials, and That's he right. wrote... Thanks for forwarding this comment. In response, I'd inform your interested listener that the career opportunities in infectious disease are broad and include fundamental research, clinical translational research, clinician teacher role at an academic center, epidemiology and public health, both domestic and international, right. private practice and industry. Mm -hmm. A substantial proportion of infectious disease fellows are pursuing master's degrees in epidemiology at their co-located schools of public health so that they have formal training in both ID there and EPI, go. biostats, right. study design, global health, etc. For more information, I'd refer him to the following websites. The Infectious Diseases Society of America, the American Society for Microbiology, and the Association of Schools of Public Health. In addition, he could surf the websites of some of the individual fellowship programs, Columbia, Partners, MGH, and Brigham in Boston, Johns Hopkins, the University of Washington in Seattle, and the University of California in San Francisco. Thanks, Scott. We'll put some of those links in the show notes. There's one other society I would mention mm -hmm. here, and that's the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Absolutely. Which has a huge outreach uh, component and uh, embraces not only parasitic diseases of a eukaryotic nature, but also covers a lot of these viral infections as well. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill wrote, TWIV team, I'm, finally I'm off the Rio virus topic. My daughter <laughs> experienced flu-like symptoms along with a meaningful percentage of her sorority at U Michigan. Her high fever, 102 body aches, fatigue, cough. Mm -hmm. My question is this. Given the need to ration the H1N1 vaccine, is it possible to inexpensively and quickly ascertain whether or not she actually had H1N1 after the fact? How hard are antibodies to assay? Simple. What is the process, and has someone manufactured a test? Mm. You know, altruistically, I would like her to have her vaccine go to someone who actually needs it. Right. Good. Good thought. Well, there are no commercial kits at the time, at the moment, for assaying antibodies to H1N1 or any influenza mm. virus. This can be done in the laboratory quite readily. Right. But no one has made a test. We look for either virus or viral genomes by PCR. Yep. Yep. Uh, a number of people have asked me this. Should you know if I've already been infected, couldn't I go to the doctor and before I get a vaccine, get an antibody test? Mm. So there's there is no test. I don't know of any being developed. And my feeling is it adds another layer of complexity. It's easier just to give the vaccine rather than to check first and see if you need it. I don't know of any situation where you do that with a vaccine. What, what do you think about that? Um, no, I'm sorry, I don't know either, but a thought occurred to me as the question was being asked, and that is, it would be a huge advantage if you could have a recovered population of known viral origin to serve as a bank for immune serum for patients that enter into a lethal phase of this infection, yeah. and they're desperate for, to, for attempts to try to cure it. I mean, sure, Tamiflu sure, sure. doesn't work at that level, but maybe immunoglobulin concentrated from these people might. Yeah, I think for the more lethal diseases for which there isn't a vaccine, that certainly is an option. But you know, Dick, there's the vaccine programs don't involve screening and then... No, no, I know. You just do it because it's the simplest way. That's right. Especially if you get into areas of the world that don't have a good health infrastructure. Right, you're right. You're right on that. just a vaccine. So, Bill, there isn't any commercial assay. But your doctor, your family doctor, might be willing to send the serum down to CDC for you. Yeah. 
Okay, one more. Dear Professor Vincent, today one of the students at our department came and asked me about how viruses are able to establish an infection and that their RNA is able to evade foreign genetic material uh -huh. de detection <laughs> mechanisms inside the cells. Okay. I answered her question with there's some sort of balance between infection and immune reactions, and that same question could be addressed saying that how body gets infected with viruses in the presence of immunity. The answer is that the outcome is de determined by which side the virus or immune system wins. Mm. God gave viruses mechanisms by which they can evade <laughs> immune systems in different ways, and I gave her some examples, e.g. HIV. How dare God do that? That infects immune cells. <laughs> That's not my I, God, by the way. <laughs> am I right? But I think I take knowledge about how this evasion takes place intracellularly. Wow, this is a topic of another twiv, but mm. there are intracellular detection mechanisms for finding viral RNA. Absolutely. The innate sensors. If interferon plays a role in this. Absolutely. And you know, they are really good mechanisms. Which is why it's for, called interferon. For every mechanism of the cell, there's a viral <laughs> countermeasure. Oh, of course. Otherwise, viruses would not exist. We have a great immune defense system. Yep. And it has three components. There's an initial intrinsic component, there's an innate component, mm -hmm. and there's an adaptive component, which Sorry. we'll talk about in, in a future episode. Sure, sure. And they're beautiful, and viruses can antagonize every one of them. Exactly. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist, so yeah. that's the answer. Okay, Dick, you've already given us a pick of the week. I did. And what was that? I forgot already. It was the double helix. The double helix by Watson. And Crick. I, I don't know if we picked that, did we? I don't think so. We can go back and look, of course. Well, let's go to TWIV. This is some website hey. called TWIV.TV. <laughs> really? Oh, look, there it is. And, I'll uh, be darned. There's our weekly picks. And let's just search for Helix here. Mm. Not found. You're right. We didn't pick it. How so could we Helix, have omitted which, that book? But it's relevant for today because we sure. talked about nucleic acid replication. That's okay, right. my pick is a... Uh, a uh, blog called Worms and Germs Blog. Hey, which I found last week, Dick. We did a story. Uh, you were you were at Johns Hopkins last week, right? I was. Yes, I was. Talking about vertical farms. This is true, but I encountered a, a Twiv listener while oh, I was there. Oh, I heard. There, That's excellent. Which is great, actually. I love that. <laughs> anyway, I, we, last week we talked about um, a, a case where they're immunizing wild animals against rabies by putting bait. baits. Uh, they have vaccinia right. virus vectors r That's right. with, with rabies proteins. And a woman... Her, she was picking blackberries, and her dog got one of these and bit it, and the, and the virus came out. And she picked it up, and it got into her lacerations, so she got a little vaccinia. Anyway, I found this blog while I was researching that. It's called Worms and Germs Blog, Promoting Safe <laughs> Pet Ownership. It's, it's a joint venture of the Ontario Veterinary College's Center for Public Health and Zoonoses well. and the <sighs> City of Hamilton Public Health Department. Right. Anyway, it's good. It has a whole worms list of diseases, including yeah, parasites. Absolutely. Well, worms, when they say worms, come on, they're all parasites, as we all just just Giardia in dog parks. Oh, sure. We should be more worried about some other things, though. Hmm. Raccoon latrines in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Raccoon roundworm. Bayless ascaris procyonus. Oh, Can't wait for the next twip. <laughs> so that's my pick of the week. Great. Worms and germs. Well, that should do it for another TWIV. If you're a new listener, please subscribe in iTunes. It's free, and you get every episode automatically. If you don't, go to TWIV.TV. You can download the episodes. You can play them, and you can see all our show notes. Now, today I've done something different. I've done a screen recording of this episode because I've shown a lot of slides to Dick, and I'm going to try and post that. So even if you get the audio, you might want to check TWIV.TV uh, for that. I meant to ask you this also. Oh, of Vince. course, Dick. Are there videos in which the viral replication cycle is depicted as a video? Yes, there are some good ones. Maybe we should try to put something like that up too to give a visual explanation. There's for some actually of this. a good one for both HIV and influenza, and I can put links. Would you like me to link? I them would that? love you to. Because yeah, right. we are visual good. animals. They're good. I wish we could make them readily, but <laughs> of course we're not <laughs> artists. No. TWIV is part of microbeworld.org. It's a community created by the American Society for Microbiology to help disseminate information about microbes. And you can also find us at sciencepodcasters.org and promednetwork.com. 
Of course, Dick and I have launched our new podcast this week in Parasitism. Uh, it's at microbeworld.org slash twip. And episode number two will be posted on Monday, November 30th, 2009. So check that out. It's also on iTunes. And that's a lot of fun because I get to ask the questions. <laughs> and I'm really learning from that as well. Well, this is a mutually uh, beneficial association, Vince. Absolutely. We're symbiotic. They can't uh, be symbiotic because we're the same species, but we are certainly uh, synergistic. Right? So symbiosis, symbiosis have to be is, a, is a concept that involves two completely different species, and we've often misused that word. But what we are is we are um, we're, we're, um, synergistic. Yes, we are because synergistic. To, uh, apart, sure. we could give lectures on these individual subjects, but commonalities between uh, any parasite and its host are mm -hmm. brought out, and then you get the complete spectrum when the two people... We should have a third person here for fungi, and another one for rickettsia, and another one for bacteria, and then, and then we could all have this wonderful conversation of how microbes across the spectrum of parasitism behave in their hosts. Absolutely. Which is the ultimate goal of this uh, Absolutely. No, I, I think that you and I have grown in this uh, role. I had a lot of fun. And that's why we've started the second podcast, that's right. because that's right. we, we realized we could extend our teaching it's and why teach we're here. me something. It's why we're here the day after Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, you see, Dick, I didn't want anyone to miss a podcast. Well, I didn't want to miss this, actually. And I also enjoyed doing it. Yeah. And um, it's nice when we have a, a group of people, because you get a lot of different viewpoints, like Rich Condit and... Yeah, and uh, Alan Dove. Well, by the so way, happy nice Thanksgiving to both of them. Happy <laughs> Thanksgiving to all our listeners. Yeah, that's right. If you celebrate Thanksgiving, exactly. And um, I also enjoy one-on-one -on -one with you because yep. it's a different kind of interaction. But we're having a good time. So that's why we're here, and we hope you enjoyed this. And of course, as always, send us your questions and comments. Twiv at twiv TV. You could send us an MP3 file, or you can call us up on Skype. Our name is Twiv Podcast, and leave us a message. Or you can go over to microbeworld.org slash twiv, and you can also leave comments there, and you can also post stories that you'd like us to talk about. Dick, thanks for coming in and doing this. I appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. You want to talk about medicalecology.org or trichinella.org? We'll do trichinella. Trichinella.org. You should uh, check that out and also check out Twiv. Not Twiv. You're Twip. This is Twiv. Twip. 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 You've been listening to This Week in Virology, Twiv, the podcast all about viruses, which are a kind of parasite in themselves. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back next week. Another Twiv is viral. Was that okay? I don't get a lot of questions, but that's fine.